this week the topic is uh, real estate development in Thailand and Cambodia. We have two pretty interesting entrepreneurs, Luca Dotti and Reed Kirtenbauer. They both uh, started their own businesses from scratch, uh, have made use of technology each in their own way to promote the business and grow it in ways uh, that wouldn't have been possible uh, in not too long ago. And so I think they're both really interesting people with interesting stories and I'd love to get started and um, maybe just have both of you spend a few minutes introducing yourself and your business and uh, what exactly it is that you do and how you got to where you are now. Thank you. Uh, I'll let uh, Luca, he can go first. Oh yeah, sure, Luca. Why don't you go? Okay, uh, Nick, thanks a lot for the invitation and it's great to see you guys. Um, I, in 2014, I co-founded Noon, which is a property developer and manager. So we own and operate a rental housing in Phuket, Thailand, um, targeting uh, uh, long and short-term rentals. Uh, so our uh, tenants, typical tenants would be international school teachers, doctors, nurses, uh, uh, FMB manager, a lot of people involved in hospitality, unfortunately, uh, which nowadays are almost all gone, and uh, uh, and also short-term uh, visitors. Um, we have been uh, building uh, uh, a few projects, completed 200 units. We have another 1,200 in pipeline. Um, we started off with a typical model of uh, selling uh, condo for sale and then leasing back the apartments that we are uh, selling. Um, and then we move on to a more private equity real estate approach um, in which we raised a fund last year and, uh, and we're building a, a, a platform of pure rental housing uh, following the multifamily model in the US. And, uh, and the whole idea is really to build communities around, uh, around real estate, uh, controlling as much as uh, the, the, the asset, but also the ecosystem, uh, meaning uh, uh, retail around the, around the building, uh, or we're looking at opening a childcare, uh, potentially developing in a full-fledged school. Um, and, uh, and we really believe that uh, people are looking more and more for experiences and, uh, and uh, and like-minded professionals or individuals when they when they uh, move into a new house, and uh, and we're betting on the fact that there's going to be more and more people renting than buying, um, simply because uh, uh, real estate is becoming less affordable, and uh, and the millennials uh, want to be more mobile, and they're looking at uh, not locking all the capital into a single asset and stay in the same place forever. T talking about technology, obviously uh, for us it plays a big part. Uh, scaling is uh, the, 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 the most important aspect for the kind of stage we are at. Uh, we had a little track record, now it's really all about uh, uh, making business bigger and uh, also beyond only Phuket, where we are today. So we're looking at expanding in Bangkok, uh, Chiang Mai, Patia, and uh, we're looking at a couple of projects in Indonesia as well. And, uh, and technology is really important for many aspects from uh, um, asset management, so the fundraising side, uh, with uh, uh, just streamlining all the investor investor relations uh, uh, communications and, and and process and fundraising uh, all the way to the uh, management of, of our back office so um, we have developed uh, uh, sort of like a, a, a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, property management software that is uh, made of uh, uh, SaaS product, they are leader in the market, they were uh, combined together uh, by a market property fund. We have about $3 million under management. Uh, I've been running that fund since about 2016. It started with a small group of... I think we may be having some connectivity issues.
the smallest property fund, but we've grown more than tenfold since then and are, are doing well. Um, but yes, uh, I had moved to Thailand doing business in Southeast Asia for about 10 years. Um, but now I'm, I'm primarily in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. But I also I run the Khmer Ventures Fund and also investasian.com, a uh, consulting website, uh, consulting uh, news website about uh, just doing, doing business and investments in, in Southeast Asia. Okay, yeah, I, um, yeah, I think there was a, a bit of a connectivity issue, I think, uh, the past got crossed, but I think we got a good overview of both uh, what Luca and Reed do. Um, I guess I'd, I'd be interested in hearing both of you talk a bit more about how you got your start and what made you decide to do the businesses that you're doing. A lot of the people who will be listening to this now or in the future, if it gets recorded, are MBA students who um, you know, we're graduating in COVID. It's not the typical time for us. A lot of us might not have the management consulting uh, offers that we usually have. And I think a lot of people are interested and excited about doing something on their own. So it'd be great if you could break down, first of all, uh, why, why you decide to do what you do and then uh, the steps that you took uh, just broadly to get there. So how about Luca, you go first. So I started um, while I was uh, living in Singapore. Uh, I moved to Asia in 2009, uh, worked most of my career in, uh, in finance, in the NASA manager, and uh, it really started as a personal investment. I Obviously, there is a big culture of uh, um, real estate uh, and design and properties in general in, in, in Southeast Asia. And, um, and I started looking at opportunities to you know, buy an apartment for myself and I started investing my, my savings. And obviously I couldn't afford to buy anything in Singapore or Hong Kong. So I started looking around that um, I, I remember that I was looking in particular at Philippines and Thailand because they allow foreign ownership uh, uh, as a, as a um, uh, free old or foreign ownership. And, and then I just like um, found myself traveling around Thailand, met a group of uh, other Italians that were doing uh, uh, very interesting stuff. They were basically contractors to big developers, but very deep into you know, property development. And through them, we found, uh, yeah, we found the opportunity to, instead of buying an apartment, buying a plot of land, uh, which was distressed. And uh, I guess there was a bit, you know, uh, I was crazy enough to jump into this without even knowing exactly the, the depth of, 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 of the uh, complexity that I was getting into. And, uh, and once I was there, we just developed uh, the business but, around it. So it was... Sure, I will. So, yeah, that's, that's how we got started. Um, look at the market, what was missing. We felt that many people were focusing on villas and, and, uh, and in general, hotels, luxury hotels. While there was a gap, there was a gap in the market for um, expats or uh, Thai. They were looking for more affordable products and uh, and long-term residents. Um, so that's how we found the opportunity and and we built the business around it. And um, and we're very lucky because we're very um, uh, still today very focused on different parts of the business. So I'm more on the finance side. Uh, we have an architect, we have an engineer, we have project managers in the, in, 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 the, in the top management and each of them manages a part of the, uh, of the venture. And, um, and this allows us really to um, have an integrated value chain uh, that uh, allows us to go out with uh, uh, better value for money for clients. And, uh, and really control cost and execution at many levels of the business. Right, yeah, and how, how about you, Reed? Uh, just to make sure the question is uh, related to just kind of how we got started and how we, uh, we got into our respective business. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, well, why, I why mean, I went to, to okay. Well, I, I went to university and this was, I, I'm fairly young, I'm 28, 29 years old next year. But so we're talking about when I was very young, 18, 19 years old, I'd fresh, freshly graduated from high school. Uh, I, I was being in LA going to high school. And I had visited Southeast Asia as a tourist several times. I was 
had been to Thailand and Hong Kong and Tokyo. And I, I was somewhat familiar with the region already. Again, we're talking 2009 or so. And uh, I knew uh, freshly upon graduating high school, I, okay, at the very least, I, I figured out at that time that, yes, I wanted to move to Southeast Asia and uh, see how things work in that part of the world. And uh, in, in many ways, especially at an undergraduate level, uh, you're going to learn the same thing at any university in the world. Like if you're taking a, an economics course, an undergrad econ course at the University of Calcutta, then you're going to uh, come out of a similar textbook and learn the same concepts for the most part as you would anywhere else in the world. So my rationale, I was really there for in Thailand more for what I would get outside of the university than inside. I was interested in um, seeing how business operates in, in, in emerging Asia, uh, learning uh, the cultural differences, maybe making some connections. That was nice, uh, definitely an incentive. But I was more there for people asking me, oh, why did you want to study in Thailand? Why don't you go to UCLA or something? I'm, going to learn the same thing at UCLA I would anywhere else in the world. So I'm going to go to Thailand and get uh, get kind of an, an extra deal outside of university, uh, not to mention, of course, university in Thailand is way less expensive than UCLA. Anyway, um, shortly after I, I uh, came to the conclusion, at least I, I personally did, that uh, most of the opportunities uh, were not in Thailand. They were in the surrounding countries in, in frontier Asia, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, the places that are growing by, uh, of course, who can say in 2020, but at least up until this point, uh, we're growing by five, six, seven percent a year. So I was going to university in Thailand. Uh, during those four years, I, I, of course, got the chance to travel around the region a lot and go to Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and all over the region. I, I, I eventually came to the conclusion that for me, Cambodia um, was where I was going to settle and start a, start a real estate business. And from there, um, it was, um, I, I mean, as I said earlier, I manage, uh, it's, uh, it's a real estate, it's also a real estate private equity fund. And there's many uh, REITs and real estate private equity funds in the world. But I thought, well, okay, what, what can I do differently? And my, my conclusion was I can be the world's first frontier market uh, real estate fund. And in a country where uh, the framework for a REIT or such a, things like that haven't really been formed yet. So it really did involve a lot of creation of, uh, of uh, for, from scratch of just the different mechanisms of which a fund and an untested part of the world works. But once I did that, um, I figured out, I mean, I was essentially the only game in town. It's like, okay, well, where else are you going to go and uh, buy real estate in, a, in, a, in Cambodia? Uh, or uh, really in any frontier market, whether it be, I don't know, Vietnam. I guess Vietnam has some REITs, but even Vietnam's even more developed than most frontier markets. It's kind of a ladder up uh, on the economic totem pole, so to speak, compared to Cambodia or Vietnam. So I started the fund and did a bit of advertising, a bit of uh, ref some people referred to me through clients and uh, existing business partners from the consulting business I had at the time, uh, which I've been doing a bit longer than the property fund. And that was, uh, that, that was really it. It was starting something where there's no competition in a frontier market, a high growth frontier market where uh, demographics and uh, urbanization rates and a young average age and all sorts of demographic uh, trends are kind of working in Cambodia's favor. And I, uh, figured that this was the place to be and, and here I am and it just kind of worked out from there. Awesome. So that brings me to my next question which I want both of you to answer which is um, if you could choose one emerging <laughs> frontier market outside of the one that you're currently uh, operating in which one would you go to? And Reed you can go first on this one. I would choose Vietnam. Um, v prop of course I, I'm uh, most of my most of the money I've made in the past is off of the stock market, but in the past three or four years, I've been especially doing property, and I've also been, I've been bought property everywhere from uh, Austin, Texas, to Tbilisi, Georgia, to Bangkok, to Nome Ben. So I, I'm also uh, 
into the prop, but to answer your question, um, the answer is Vietnam. And Vietnam's a bit tricky because in, in Cambodia, foreigners can own freehold property. In Vietnam, every, everything is on a leasehold. So if I were in Vietnam, I would probably be more into stock trading than, than real estate like I am now. But to answer your question, pro probably Vietnam. I think it has many of the demographic trends and uh, urbanization rate. They have a young average age of 26, 20. So many of the same fact, long-term factors I like about Cambodia, Vietnam, and also the Philippines for that matter. Uh, I, I like both Vietnam and the Philippines probably for stock trading more so than real estate. How about you, Luca? Yeah, I, I agree with me that I I would love Vietnam because I mean I I just like the country a lot. I think there is a it's a great place to live. Uh, so I would spend personally a lot of time there, and uh, and it's great great potential. Uh, demographics is amazing. There's a lot of investment, private equity investment that went in. It's a very hot market, but it's very difficult as we said. So. Probably, I would, I would probably, if I, if I had to be in the real estate space, I would probably pick uh, Philippines, which is the most uh, similar in terms of uh, um, regulations uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ownership um, uh, laws around, uh, around real estate to, to Thailand. And um, again, great demographics. It's... Uh, it's interesting what's happening there. Uh, what what we do in the more affordable sector, it's uh, it's a is a sector that is dominated by hip dorms. Um, so people are not really looking for places where they can live full time, but rather stay from Monday to Friday just to be the uh, the commute, and then on the weekends they go back to their places. So we are talking about like. Uh, bunk beds and uh, really like dorms so it's a different it's a different stage of evolution uh but yeah in a few years i'm sure they're gonna catch up with the rest of asia and i'd love to be there for doing what we're doing in thailand great and i guess going back to career journeys i'll, I'll start with reed what is one thing that uh, you would have, if you were to start today, what would you do differently if you were starting the same business? Oh, that's a good question. What would I do differently? I would have hired, I would have been stronger right out of the gate hiring staff, as I, as I think what I would do. Um, right now, I, I have several people working uh, for the company, but... Uh, Obviously, I mean, as as a business owner, you kind of part of you wants to at least get a certain amount of cash flow before hiring twenty people. Um, I guess in venture capital, it is uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily know, but in many cases, it's vice versa. But uh, yes, I wished uh, that I had um, just right out of the gate five, ten people working in everything from maintenance to. Uh, relations with local realtors and uh, that uh, kind of get get the logistics uh, uh, moving sooner rather than later, I, I suppose would be the answer. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. What about you, Luca? Uh, that's a good one. I, 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 if I, if I look at the, at the structure of the company today in which we really internalize a lot of processes, it's kind of like uh, the result of... Um, uh, mistakes we made in the past in uh, trusting third parties and uh, and and uh, and uh, and getting disappointed by their services. So if I had to go back, I would probably um, yeah, just like uh, um, integrate even more and sooner, um, probably earning maybe one or two years of work that got lost because uh, we just like uh, trusted the wrong people. But that's part of the journey, right? I mean, you 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 need to make mistakes in order to uh, you know to be stronger and 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 build a better business. I mean, I'm sure the read would have loved to have uh, delegated uh, from day one much more, but uh, the experience that he got in in doing most of the things himself for a period of time, it's you know he made it 
a much better boss today because he knows exactly what problems the person that is hiring needs to solve. Sure, definitely. Uh, since both of you spoke to, I guess, human relations a little bit, uh, read when it comes to hiring and Luca, in terms of uh, building trust, is there something that you found um, necessary to build relationships in uh, in the Indochina region, in Thailand or Cambodia, um, that you didn't know before you, you came there? Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah and, not, and not necessarily. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Not not necessarily something that I did. I mean, there's a few. I guess one obvious thing that I would say that almost seems too basic to mention, but I think should, that should really be driven home is uh, that language and culture is important. And it sounds really cliche, but I, I, I've seen numerous people thinking that they can just show up in developing Asia and they speak English and they think, oh, I'm just gonna, oh, I don't, I, I've actually had people speak, say to me in the past, uh, oh, I don't, uh, in different countries, I'm going to use Khmer, Cambodia as an example, but they would say, oh, I don't speak Khmer, I hire Khmer. And I think, oh, I'm sure your staff highly respect you and don't talk about you behind your back at all. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it, I mean, if obviously if you're managing people, it's nice to know their language. It's nice to know their culture. And you can't just hire people and automatically assume that things are going to happen correctly without some sort of managerial oversight or someone who has a stake in the whole operation being on hand and supervising people. And sometimes even being very, very people, maybe in Cambodia more so than a lot of places, you really need to be on people and uh, make sure they're doing what they're doing. Um, but yes, that's uh, that's something I, I think is worth mentioning, even if, uh, oh, know the culture and speak the language seems a bit cliche. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people uh, uh, fresh off the boat who don't speak a word of Vietnamese trying to do business in Vietnam and they just failed miserably at it. <laughs> so that's something that uh, I, I think is important. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I think what, what was interesting for me was, uh, you know, coming from Italy where the, the, the culture is uh, finish university, get a job, and then stick to that job forever and that was the mentality of you know even my dad that told me study engineering get a job and you'll be fine um when i came to asia i realized how fluid actually the job market it is and how higher and uh, and uh, and uh, so i think understanding the and be empathic with with the with the employees that today are with you and without very little reason uh, they get the, the salary at the end of the month and then they just resign because whatever they don't feel like coming anymore because they fought with uh, another employee i found that incredible and um because it was so far from you know the the the, the mentality i was coming from in, in, in europe and uh, and that's that's probably one of the most interesting and difficult parts of managing people that i had to learn be more empathic with the, with, with the people we hire. Totally. Uh, since both of you have used technology a lot to grow your businesses in different ways, I was wondering if there is one piece of technology or platform that you use in business or in your daily life that has made the most difference for you and that uh, you find the most useful. WordPress and a bit of PHP coding. I'm definitely not a coder. That's not my expertise, but uh, I know I know a bit of uh, coding enough to kind of futz with it a bit and not create things from scratch. But as far as uh, web design uh, and marketing, obviously it's great to know how to make Facebook ads and, and target properly and, and all of that. Uh, all of which WordPress, a bit of PHP or HTML, uh, Martin, not difficult to learn, and I, I think it's it's invaluable if you're doing any sort of online business. Yeah, for us, uh, uh, I think cloud made uh, made the difference completely in the in, in the business. Uh, uh, obviously, like uh, open API um, that allow 
different softwares and services to speak to each other and be integrated. Uh, we use uh, Azure as a, as a cloud platform and uh, uh, in that we store, uh, we basically like connect so many different pieces of, of our business that, 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 made, that made a huge, huge difference. It's something that it wouldn't be possible 10 years ago when uh, yeah, you were just like buying a ERP and uh, be stuck with it. And, uh, and uh, hopefully that would adapt uh, enough to your business. And that was actually your business that was adapting to the software. Today, you really have the opportunity to uh, build the software that you want, uh, leveraging on very smart people out there. They are developing different pieces and you just put them together like a, like a puzzle. And um, so that, 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 that's, uh, that's amazing. Great. So I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open up to the audience now. So if um, anyone in the audience has a question, people free to raise your hand or just type it in in the chat and I can ask it. I guess while we're waiting, I'll ask my next question, which is about COVID. I know it's definitely affected both of your businesses, but I'd be curious to know uh, to what extent and also uh, what predictions you have for the future on how um, COVID will have, how, what the new normal will be when it comes to real estate investing and hospitality in this part of the world? Um, well, COVID-19 in Cambodia right now, there's, uh, of course, Southeast Asia as a region is doing way better than practically anywhere else in the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, in Cambodia, there's 200 and 50 confirmed total cases. There's about 30 active cases. No local transmissions here for about two months, two or three months. Um, obviously, the tourism businesses are suffering a lot. There's no tourists here. There's no, no tourist visas are issued. There, 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 there's no tourists. So anyone with a hotel or, or anything like that, uh, a restaurant, that, a bar that caters primarily to tourists, they're having difficulties right now. Um, my business is fortunate in the sense that we have rented to expats and locals and have little reliance on the tourism sector. And, and from what I've found, the people who were in Cambodia before all of this happened and when it was starting to play out, for the most part, all of them have stayed. I've had one tenant in the past few months leave. And really, that's, that's it. Um, we've, we've had one tenant leave. All, again, everyone renting is, is pretty much, they're an expat and they're, they're meant to stay here long term. Um, I can't speak for the future. I think, uh, as usual, people who are prepared and who listen to science will do just fine. And uh, those who, who don't will be stuck in a leper colony and uh, are not going to be able to leave their country. So Cambodia is doing fine. Movie theaters oh, just started good. opening last week, and uh, we're doing great here. Great. So we have we have two parts of the business, and and both are affected uh, differently. So uh, one part, which is the property development, uh, is uh, very little affected. But luckily, we have two construction sites that uh, were stopped for just a couple of weeks which is in the economy of a two years construction, it's uh, almost negligible. So that, uh, uh, that, that, that's fine. Uh, while the, the rental business of the completed apartments is suffering a lot. So we're running at about 20% occupancy rate while we should be at 90. Um, it's better than hotels. Uh, they are closed completely. Uh, so we have some long-term residents that stayed, many left. Um, and uh, yeah, it's enough to pay the bills and uh, we kept all the, the team on board. Um, uh, the, the, the team that is directly involved in the, in the day to day operations were asked to work uh, six hours a day so we could save some, uh, some, a little bit of their salary, but we didn't fire anybody. For us, it was very important to keep the, the team on board because it took us so long to you know, find the right guys that you know, I, I really struggle with the idea of like, get rid of everybody and then we build from scratch a business in six months. Um, the, 
the future, I think there's going to be a lot of pain in the coming six months. I don't think that international travel is going to resume until after Chinese New Year. So we're looking really at March, uh, April, hopefully. Um, after that, uh, there's going to be many businesses that are not going to be open anymore. Uh, obviously, if you're on a hotel and you find that 200 people and uh, you need to restart knowing okay. that you're going to be in a 50% occupancy rate for six to eight months or even a year, probably you're not going to do it. You're just going to sell the asset and, and forget about it, uh, especially after that. Thailand uh, reported like a record growth in the past 10 years, so they all made money. Um, so there's going to be definitely less competition and that's going to be interesting for people that survive. Um, I think COVID is, is going to bring also uh, changes. I mean, this call is showing us that we don't need to be in an expensive apartment in Singapore to be productive. And uh, so hopefully we decide to move to Cambodia or, or, or Phuket and, and, and work from there in the same time as one of the employer. So I think this is going to bring definitely opportunities like all crisis. But there's going to be a lot of pain for another six to eight months at least. Um, yeah, so Luca may have just given his answer, but uh, the next question was to finish on a more positive note after COVID. And basically, I was going to ask, uh, where do you see the biggest opportunity in your business now um, going forward? For me, um, as I said, I think uh, at least in Cambodia, the rest of the country seems to be doing fine. Uh, aside from the tourism sector, uh, obviously when there's no tourists, there's no money to make off of tourism. But as far as manufacturing and uh, the rest of the economy, it seems to be doing fine. Um, th the plan right now is to just have any cash that we already have on hand. I mean, that's the, I mean, in a crisis, obviously, unless you're, you plan on shorting the market or doing the, something a bit more uh, complex. It's nice to have cash on hand. Um, I would love to go to uh, someone with a, maybe, maybe a hotel that they've mortgaged and it isn't working out and convert it into an apartment building. Um, Oh, the tourism, again, obviously is going to suffer. I think in apartments in central Phnom Penh or central, any city will will do fine in the long run. Not any city, Central Singapore, Central Bangkok, Central Phnom Penh. I think city center apartments are going to do fine. Um, tourism, it's going it's going to depend a lot. I think Luca was correct in saying that we're, it's going to be a while before trans uh, travel is back um, to where it was before it. Uh, the, the, the middle of next year minimum in my opinion possibly a, a good deal later it's going to depend on when a vaccine is out and then there's a whole matter of logistics getting the vaccines to people and then the governments have to come out with their policies so even if there, if there was a vaccine released tomorrow by Pfizer let's see someone a bit more credible than the Russian government I mean even then there's a whole process and it's going to take a while I think but um Desperate people are, are, are desperate during desperate times and people who are prepared uh, are, are, are fine is uh, how, how it works. So I, I, the only thing I can say is as far as opportunities, just, just be flexible, play it as it goes. Um, try to not out leverage, use more leverage than you can handle. And um, we can only see. Great. I think the, it, it, in, for, for us, the biggest opportunity right now is really to develop uh, uh, as much as possible facilities in our real estate projects that will accommodate the new trends. So the fact that not only digital nomads or expats, but rather families will make life choices to move to places where the cost of living is lower and the quality is higher. Um, so what are they looking for? So they're looking for a co-working space with uh, um, uh, individual uh, pods where they can make uh, important phone calls so they can find the right productivity environment. Uh, there will be uh, babysitting or childcare on call. Uh, there will be all these sort of like settings and, and, uh, and uh, that will accommodate uh, not only people that come on holiday or the single guy that come to party in Phuket, right? But also 
also people that are looking for more um, important services, which could be healthcare, it could be education, etc. So I think really putting our head into uh, how can we uh, develop the best uh, places that will, you know, um, uh, lever on, on on these new on these new behaviors. That's probably the biggest opportunity. Definitely. Well, I found this super interesting. I thank both of you for joining. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot more for us to talk about, but uh, I think this wraps it up for a, a, a great first call with both of you, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right, have a good night, guys. Bye.